excited just to be here. And I know that this conversation was purposed on today. You know, I was looking for my keys. I walked out this morning, took my dog out, came back. I don't know what I did with my keys. So I'm looking for the keys on today, and I'm like, oh my God, where are my keys? My girlfriend was downstairs waiting on me, and I'm like, I cannot find my keys. That's very unusual, because I always sit them somewhere where I know they'll be. Anybody else? Right, you always sit them somewhere you know they'll be. So I couldn't find my keys, so I had to go downstairs and ask the concierge, you know, if they'll be able to let me into my apartment when I get back. And they assured me that they would. So we're on our way traveling here, and I'm putting on my makeup and all that good stuff. And lo and behold, guess where the keys were? <laughs> With my lipstick and everything else. I'm like, well, how would it get there? That's so unusual. So I, I know that this conversation is purpose. You know, I started to get a little frustrated. I'm like, okay, God, really? Today? This is going to happen today when I'm going to do your work? But you know, everything that happens in life, uh, I look for the lesson in it. I look to see why it's happening, why it's happening to me, and why it's happening to me in this season. But there was a time that I did not do that. There was a time that I would get frustrated and I would get overwhelmed and I would try to figure out why things are happening the way that they're happening. Anybody else in here with me have that same thing? And even for my marriage, you know, I remember my husband and I have been married for seven years. And I remember early on in our marriage, the first couple years, it was really rough. It was rough because of the lack of understanding of marriage. It was rough because we were so busy trying to change one another. It was rough because we were so busy not taking ownership but blaming the other person for the reasons why the marriage was the way that it was. And we simply did not take ownership. But when I learned the medicine and the power of prayer, and I'll tell you a little bit of history about that. I come from a family of prayer. I come from a mother who walked the floors at night, who would put anointing oil. Anybody know about anointing oil? Mm -hmm. Who would put anointing oil on our head, right? It was four of us, four girls. So when we would act up or, or be rebellious or do things that we had no business doing, we would be met at the door with the anointing oil. <laughs> or when we went to bed at night, the anointing oil was on us. When we got up in the morning, the anointing oil was on us. So we understood what the anointing oil was and I understood the power of prayer because I saw how prayers shifted the atmosphere of my house. I saw how prayers shifted my family. I saw how prayer shifted my father. So I saw how prayer worked. And when I got older, I told myself that I want to be just like that. I want to be so consistent in my prayer life and having an understanding of prayer to when I call on God, heaven will come down for me. Yeah. And I did exactly that. So in the year of 1999, I gave my, Lord, my life to the Lord for real, for real. And I decided that I was gonna live for God. But that did not come without adversity. That did not come with struggles. That did not come with me being a typical 19 year old, right? You know, there were still things that I was wrestling with. There, there were still things that I wanted to do and, and who I thought I wanted to become. But one thing was for sure, I knew who God was. And I had developed at that time, at 19 years old, a prayer life. I remember going into my room, they call it a closet now, but it was actually my bedroom. And I would pray for hours. I would just sit before the Lord and I would worship before the Lord. And I didn't understand then what I know now, but that was time and preparation for my life right now. That was even time and preparation for a marriage. So even in the first couple years when we were so busy blaming one another and not taking ownership and not being grown up enough to say, okay, this is what we need to do to fix it. I learned the power of prayer and how it was vitally necessary in my marriage. So what did I learn to do? Pray. Pray for my husband. Pray for our family. But I'm going to tell you this one thing. In my initial prayers, guess what they were? Lord, change him. <laughs> Lord, fix him because he is the problem. I come from a family of prayer, Lord. All of my family have served you all of their lives. You know, all of the things that they've done, they've set me up for such a time as this. So he is the issue. It wasn't until the time I said, God, you know what? Maybe he isn't the issue. Maybe, maybe there is some things that I need to work on. You know, I'm, you know maybe four things. I need to work on that I haven't mastered yet because surely I've mastered everything else. I have a business, I have a ministry, I've been a great mom, I, you know, I have property, I have all of these things, so surely there's not much that I need to be able to do. But it was in that moment when I prayed and I asked God to show me me, he did exactly that. 
And my prayers went from, Lord, fix him, to Lord, fix me. Lord, show me what is inside me that's preventing the growth in my marriage. Show me what's inside me that is igniting these arguments that are senseless arguments. Show me what's inside of me that to the point that I can't, we can't even see eye to eye with one another over something stupid, the trash, not being taken out of the dishes, not being washed. Everything was an uh, uh, argument or, or everything was high and, and, and intense. Mm -hmm. The simplest thing. And what I found to be true is that a lot of times we are spiritually grown, per se. You know, we've mastered going to church. We've mastered reading our little devotional every day. We've mastered those things. But we haven't mastered our emotions. Mm -hmm. Do you know that your emotional health and your spiritual health are two different things? Mm -hmm. Do you know that in, in the same way you're working on yourself spiritually and making sure that you know you are disciplined in your prayer life, you are disciplined in serving a ministry and things of that nature, you also have to look inside your emotions to see what things inside of you that are still stagnating personal growth and growth in your marriage. How much better your marriage would be when you learn how to take ownership, even if it's at somebody else's, even if it's somebody else's fault. Even if what your husband or your wife did or say, you know, cause you to act out of character. We're all believers in here, right? Everybody believe in God, right? So when we talk about prayer and prayer being medicine, we can look at any scripture in the Bible and see how it relates to our life. You know, I know we are familiar with the Lord's Prayer. And to let you know, the Lord's Prayer was a prayer for us to emulate, not necessarily to say word by word, Amen. but it's a prayer for us to emulate in doing the things that was done in that moment. Praying, praising, worshiping, trusting God. It's a model so that we can repeat and bring it to our own marriage. And anytime we pray, when we talk about prayer, if you have an anger issue, if you have insecurities, if you've dealt with betrayal, neglect, rejection, mm -hmm. abandonment, mm -hmm. and I'm pretty sure all of us at some point have dealt with that. You know who I know? Because everybody in here dealt with the loss of a close family member, correct? Mm -hmm. Some people in here have gone through divorce. Some people in here may have lost a child. Some people in here may be struggling in their marital relationship and it feels like rejection and neglect. So we all at some degree or another have experienced that. Fatherlessness, motherlessness, even if you had a guardian or grandparents or whomever that have raised you, all of those things play a factor in our life and they begin to affect our life. So what I had to do, I had to start looking at those things. I grew up in a two-parent home, but my father passed away three days before my 18th birthday. And I didn't understand the effect of his passing and not being in my life, of how it affected me. And even prior to his passing, my I had a father that was there physically and financially, but emotionally, a lot of times he wasn't there. The same father that grew up with his sisters and brothers because his parents died when he was just a boy. So imagine a young boy being raised by other, by other young boys and other young men. Now getting a wife and getting a family and trying to be a father. Just imagine, imagine all of the disconnections that was there and he could not give to me as a daughter or my other sisters. So then imagine that girl growing up and getting into a marriage, not understanding the disconnect. And I'm telling you this for a reason so you can understand that when you go to pray, you have to understand what you're praying for. You're not just praying, God, fix my marriage, God, fix my husband, but God, deal with my anger issue. And as a matter of fact, God, anger is a secondary emotion. There's something underneath that. Right. Lord, you know what? I still have rejection issues. I'm still struggling with abandonment. I'm still wanting to be accepted. I'm wanting to be loved, and I'm wanting to be validated. And I'm wanting somebody to tell me that I am enough. And that's no one's job but God. But God. So when we understand the power of prayer, yes, prayer changes things. Yes, prayer can break and can shift and can move. But we have to understand its purpose in our situation in the moment. We don't use that just so God, we don't use that as prostituting God. We don't use our prayers in that form. Even if we can pray eloquently, pray in tongues and all of that, all of that is great. 
But at the end of the day, we have to understand how, how the power of prayer reaches us in our situation in that moment. In that moment. So I'm going to read the Lord's Prayer, what the model prayer is considered. And I'm reading this in the message version. And it says, the world is so full. This is the preceding verses. Verse 7. The world is so full of so-called prayer warriors who are prayer ignorant. They're full of formulas and programs and advice. Peddling techniques for getting what you want from God. Did I just say that? Don't fall for that nonsense. This is your father you're dealing with. And he knows better than you know what you need. With a God like this loving you, you can pray simply like this. And I want to stop there for a minute. It says that he is your father. When we learn to look at God as our father, prayer is simply request, supplication. Yes, it's praise. Yes, it's worship. But when you look at God as your father, you're going in to pray. What would you ask your father if you were in need of something? What, 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 how would you go to him and you would request of him whatever it is that you need? That's the same manner that we should go to God and pray. Lord, this is what I need from you. It's not about anybody else right now, but it's about me and you. So it's vitally in your daily prayer time to be doing just that. Yes, I say daily. Because as believers, guess what? We are to pray how often? Yeah. Without ceasing. <laughs> Always praying. But a lot of times we don't pray until what? Something bad, Something bad happens. Mm -hmm. Now we snotting, we crying, we calling everybody to the, the, the prayer circle. <laughs> but just imagine if you had a lifestyle of prayer. And how when things do happen, you're not going to be moved. You're not going to be shifted. Because you have a lifestyle of prayer. You have developed this relationship with God. And understanding, Lord, that whatever I ask, you're going to provide. Right? Because all the promises in you are what? Yes and amen. amen. And there's no good thing that he'll withhold from me. So if you're asking for something and it's not being delivered, is it a good thing? Right? So just imagine the relationship. So it says, our Father in heaven, reveal who you are. That's that time of worship. Lord, reveal who you are to me. Holy is your name. Yeah. Righteous is your name. Savior is your name. Redeemer is your name. Healer is your name. Y'all get shout. Y'all want to shout? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Provider is your name. Reveal who you are to me. What do you need him to be to you in that moment? What do you need him to be in your marriage in that moment? See, this is not about going to bug and nag and complain to your husband or your wife. This is about God. This is what I need from you. Because regardless if Johnny or Julie get it together, this is what I need from you. My allegiance is to you, not him, not her. They are a benefactor to my relationship with you. Have y'all ever thought about that? Have y'all ever thought about that? See, we make it all about the husband and all about the wife. They are benefits to your relationship with the yes. Father. Yes, amen. The marriage is the greatest demonstration of Christ's love toward his church. You are yes. his church. Yes. And when we get that right, a lot of times things are happening because we, we're making each other idols. We're worshiping our spouses more than we're worshiping God. Come on. We're so concerned about what our spouses are doing or what they're not doing more than we are. Okay, God, this is what you're doing in my life. Amen. Let me shift my focus. Because it's when I shift my focus and it's in my transformation that my marriage will also be transformed. Set the world right. Do what's best as above. So below. So God is all about doing what's best for you. Can I tell you a secret? You don't even know what's best for you. <laughs> I know we like to think that. And I'm going to put myself, we don't even know what's best for us. Because why? We are a created thing. We were made by the creator. So what you think the creator know more about the created thing Amen. than the created thing? Yeah. Come on, somebody. 
Well, you know, Steve, when you think Steve Jobs, I know he's passed and gone away, no more about Apple than the people that actually work there. Right? Am I right about it? Because he what? He created it. So we have to trust God as our created thing. And to know that he's giving us what's best for us. Keep alive with three square meals. Keep us forgiven with you and forgiving others. That means he is going to give you everything that you need. Everything. I said earlier, he'll withhold no good thing from you. Do you believe that? So when you're praying your prayer, Lord, I believe that you're going to give me everything that I need. I believe that there's no good thing that you withhold from me. You know, a lot of times when I'm coaching wives, I say, leave your husband out of the equation for a minute. And let's focus on you. What do you need from God? What do you need God to do within your heart? My gosh. Oh, no, it's him, it's him, it's him. No, no, no. The fact that you're blaming him and you're not taking ownership tells me that you're the issue. <laughs> right? It tells me that you're the issue. Keep us safe from ourselves and the devil. Because why? You're in charge. He's in charge. You can do anything you want. You're a blazing beauty. Yes, yes, yes. So when we talk about prayer, we have to understand the relationship that we have with God is going to be our, our doorway to getting our prayers answered. Mm -hmm. It's not that God don't answer prayers, because God is talking all the time. But are you taking the time out to listen? Are your ears to his lips? Or are you saying, I don't have time to pray? I got work, I got school, I have the kids, and I have to be to work early. And I gotta do this, and I gotta do 